evening, everyone. And um, let me uh, welcome all of you to, uh, to this uh, seminar, uh, which is on a rather provocative subject, uh, which is to say, uh, South Asia, does it have a future? Uh, I wonder if it has had a past. Um, uh, present, uh, yes. Uh, maybe we are stuck in between. Uh, so uh, this is a serious uh, subject for the simple reason that, um, um, I mean, those of you who are familiar with uh, what I have been writing in the past and something that, of course, Swahasni, in a different way, has been putting uh, forward, is that um, if India wishes to play a credible and optimal role, uh, both in the region of uh, Asia, as well as uh, play a global role, uh, it is indispensable uh, for India to have a very stable uh, and a very uh, prosperous uh, neighborhood in South Asia. Uh, that is, to my mind, indispensable for the simple reason that, um, you know, if your periphery is in turmoil, then uh, you keep getting pulled back uh, to, the, to the region, uh, because if a crisis happens, whether you like it or not, you are getting involved. The problem uh, has been, my experience has been, that, uh, you know, our engagement with South Asian neighbors is episodic. Uh, crisis occurs, we get very much involved, Crisis is somehow, you know, ameliorated or, or recedes in importance, and we, we seem to forget about, uh, about it. Uh, so this is not the way uh, to, to, uh, to, ju uh, to actually manage your uh, neighborhood. Uh, second point I would like to make is with respect to the present. Um, uh, we are talking about, for example, India, you know, uh, becoming the voice of the South. Uh, at the G20 uh, summit. Uh, what better way to actually build towards that to at least then give a stake of, of your own neighbors? Okay, can we call our neighbors and say, what would you like us, India, uh, to do with respect to your interest as far as uh, you know, uh, G20 is concerned? Uh, so can it become part and parcel of that you know, global south representation that we seem to have decided is actually in India's uh, favor. Uh, whether we will do it or not, I don't know, but uh, certainly it occurs to me that uh, a global south uh, kind of a concept uh, also cannot uh, uh, divorce itself from, the, from uh, your neighborhood. Uh, so uh, I remember that during the early years there was a sense in our ministry that, uh, you know, let's forget about these pesky neighbors, you know, our destiny lies in establishing really close relations with a dynamic, you know, Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, why should we worry about them? Uh, soon we discovered that you, whether you like it or not, you have to worry <laughs> about them. Uh, and then came a phase, and that was inaugurated by uh, Atal Bihari Bajpayee, our Prime Minister who completely changed the whole narrative and said, uh, you know, the integration, integration of South Asia is something which is very, you know, critical for India's interests. So he came up with some very, uh, you know, uh, shall I say, rather, rather uh, grand ideas of, you know, there being a directly elected uh, South Asian parliament. He talked about a South Asian currency, uh, customs union. Uh, why not? Why not uh, really go in, a, in in an integrative process, very similar to the very successful European integration process? Um, but that was that was uh, then. Uh, so what has happened is, I think we have uh, come full circle, starting from pesky neighbors. Let's go beyond them. To no, this is where we must start, and this must be the platform for whatever you want to do you know, regionally and globally, to back again today uh, to the same syndrome. That is, pesky neighbors, let's forget about them, let's do something, something uh, beyond them. Uh, which I believe uh, will again not really simply uh, 
uh, but that's my uh, judgment. We have some of the most uh, you know, erudite uh, experts here uh, to um, tell us about what their view is with respect to um, uh, South Asia. Does it, have a, does it have a future or not? And to start this, um, this, um, this discourse, I call upon uh, Suhashni Hyder, diplomatic editor of uh, the Hindu, and who has been uh, pers uh, involved with this particular subject for uh, many years. Uh, so I think uh, she will have uh, very important things to say about this. Uh, Suhashni, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanan. And um, it's such a pleasure to see all of you and to see that you can write the word South Asia in the subject line and still have so many people uh, actually show up and, and, you know, and, and, and take it seriously. Um, but it didn't escape me uh, that in the title of the talk, we put South Asia in quotes. Uh, and that's for a specific reason, because South Asia is a make-believe word. Uh, it does not have the past. You're quite right. Uh, I've been looking historically at when South Asia was first spoken about, and I was able to find this really interesting uh, 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 sort of um, uh, report uh, published by the U.S. State Department in 1959. Uh, it was titled The Subcontinent of South Asia, Afghanistan, Ceylon, India, Nepal, and Pakistan. So this was in 1959. And clearly, the establishment of the time uh, was not in favor of using even this kind of word. Uh, obviously, a lot of skepticism, a lot of belief that this was part of, in those days, the idea of the balance of power, uh, that everyone was out to somehow balance India's power in the region. And so you had both China and Pakistan making these uh, outrageously, uh, what seems now in hindsight to be really, really, uh, uh, um, what should I say? But unusual or uh, wrong choices when it came to helping Pakistan become a nuclear power and all the rest of that. Um, so we had this in the 1960s. I think the 1971 war uh, changed a lot of the perceptions in our neighborhood, in the South Asian region, if you like, uh, which we still were not calling South Asia, uh, because it suddenly became apparent that India could take care of the neighborhood that it could stand up for a country in the region or for a, a, a people that became a country uh, in the region. And you saw the discourse. Uh, this is part of some of the research I've done. I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, the discourse in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, even in Pakistan, that followed uh, uh, 1971, changed this impression of India as a predominant power uh, of its uh, region. Then you come to the 1980s. Again, some skepticism because it was Bangladesh. We all know that Sark was not an Indian idea. It came from Bangladesh, probably pushed along by Pakistan, with the idea that you would build this South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation with the idea of keeping India in its place and somehow bringing India into this neighborhood construct so that it would always uh, you know, be kept a little held down, if you like, by this. And certainly the SAAP process was held down uh, for a very long time. So again, you see skepticism uh, in the 1980s, certainly uh, 1990s, until, as uh, Mr. Saran said, you had this concept came about, I would say, maybe just a little pre-Prime Minister Bajpai with Prime Minister Gujral's plan for composite dialogue with Pakistan, the Mahakali Agreement with Nepal, the uh, um, uh, Ganga agreement with Bangladesh, uh, and the idea of what was called the Gujral Doctrine in later years. In the last seven years, so 2016 to 2023, we have a new concept. Neighborhood first remains, but integrated neighborhood uh, is not a whole of region approach. It is what part of the region you can work with approach. Some of it uh, clashes, if you like, with the idea. If you're saying, I'm going to isolate Pakistan, and this is something said officially by our government and by our leaders. If you say you're going to isolate Pakistan, how do you then talk about South Asia at all? Because there's a Pakistan and, by extension, Afghanistan uh, over there. Those ideas clash with each other. So again, we've seen the concept of South Asia come under fire, come under some amount of uh, mockery, skepticism, uh, disbelief. Uh, different regional groupings are heard about, BIMSTEC, BBI, and those, you know, will work for the more, for the point. 
But if you look geographically, and now I'm not talking about whether South Asia is a made-up word or not, etymologically. In reality, geographically, there is no choice. This is one geographic unit, whether it's the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush to the north or the Indian Ocean to the south. What you're looking at is one region, geographically, and of course, historically. Even if you want to forget history, most of us do want to these days, we want to recreate a new history. Um, it, is, uh, it is necessary to see that geographically we are one unit. Those of us who have had the privilege of traveling to every one of the countries in South Asia, uh, and I'm one of them, I will tell you that this is more than a landmark. It's a cultural being. There is no part of South Asia that doesn't have something in common with some part of India, whether it's language, whether it's food, whether it's a sense of humor. Uh, it's why we find television shows do so well in each other's countries, why music, I mean, I don't need to go into music in Tagore and all the rest of that. But it is clear that this is not enough. It is clear that if South Asia is to have a future, there is going to have to be something more, because what I've said so far is what everybody already knows. Um, so I will just uh, come to the basic crux of what I'm saying, which is that it is not whether South Asia is to have a future, but all our future challenges have an answer in South Asia. If you look at climate change, if you look at terrorism, if you look at the resultant situation from the Ukraine war, because part of it is going to be the war itself, part of it is going to be global polarization, part of it is going to be economic polarization, part of it is food, fertilizer, um, uh, uh, energy security, fuel security. Uh, all of these issues do have a South Asian solution, whether you want to look at it or not. Um, variants of the COVID virus and health pandemics of the future, again, if you can work with it as a region, you can isolate it as a region, you have that much better an opportunity. The Vaccine Maitri Initiative showed how much you can do within a region. Um, and, uh, and equally with the other challenges, security challenges we face, and I know those are the most unrealistic ones to tackle um, because of the problems between India and Pakistan, and of course Afghanistan as well. The fact is that the answers will lie here. The rest of the world will move on in its own ways. And already, if you ask me, the rest of the world has moved on to a more regional future. Globalization is increasingly a bad word, whether it's been COVID, whether it's been uh, the eco economy, whether it has been the, in the impact of China's uh, economic practices on the US manufacturing, on European manufacturing. Globalization is not in, in great order today. People are moving towards regionalization. We're the only region in the world that actually doesn't have that regional underpinning today. We don't have that structure. The US has the USMCA. South, uh, South America has Mercosur. Uh, European Union, we've all talked about. Um, ASEAN is getting more and more into RCEP. Um, the Gulf has its GCC. The African Union has an African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We are the only ones that are lagging behind. So if we are not looking at that future, we can ask the question, does South Asia have a future? Uh, if these ideas seem far-fetched to you, the, the idea that we could have a common in, uh, 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 jobs pool for South Asians, that we could uh, together have a oil cartel that decides fuel rates for the world, or that we can tackle environment, in what are called common air sheds, air pollution. Nine out of 10 of the most polluted cities in the world are in, sorry to say it, but South Asia, uh, in these countries. Um, the, the fact is that we are home to two-fifths of uh, the world's poor. We're home to one-fifth of the world's population. We account for only 3% of global output, 2% of world exports. That Those figures might be growing. These are a little old. But the question I do want to ask you all, and I'd love to hear your questions at the end of this, is really not whether South Asia has a future, because every country in this region will have a future, regardless of whether they have an integrated future. But whether we can recognize that there is a future that doesn't resemble the immediate past. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suhasini. Uh, I think you have uh, in a very stark terms laid, laid out what the challenges are. Uh, let me just add to that that uh, uh, 
although the history of SARC was that uh, India looked upon these uh, smaller neighbors as somehow uh, trying to gang up against uh, India, and therefore you had to somehow, you know, uh, down the hatches, as it were. The um, uh, the change in mindset came when we began to realize that actually uh, the asymmetry of power, which India enjoyed. I mean, India was is the most powerful country with all the neighbors put together, whether it is in economic terms, military terms, technological terms. Uh, and therefore, in terms of, say, if India had the aspiration to really emerge as the engine of growth for this entire region, that asymmetry actually becomes a huge asset. Because even if you open your market to everything that your neighbors can actually sell in your market, it would still be a small fraction of your market. Even if you opened out your entire transport network, to your neighbors, use whichever railway line you want, highway you want, whichever port you want. You become the partner of choice in terms of you know their uh, economic interests. Um, you know, look at what this can this can do uh, in terms of the political influence that you are looking for. Uh, so it's it's a different way of actually looking at at uh, you know how do we how do we manage this uh, uh, region. Uh, today, we are talking about, um, you know, BIMSTEC uh, as if we should forget about SARC and we should go for uh, BIMSTEC. I would say not that you should downgrade uh, BIMSTEC, but there is no reason why that should become a substitute for the SARC. I think there is much merit in actually reviving uh, SARC. Um, <clears throat> may I now turn to uh, Dr. Sanjay Kachuria, senior visiting fellow center for policy research and a long time very senior official in the World Bank and with whom I had the privilege of uh, working together on issues relating to South Asia, uh, which exercise still continues. Uh, but um, Sanjay has been uh, you know, doing a tremendous amount of work on uh, you know, trade among South Asian countries, um, you know, the economic aspect that I spoke about, what, how a game changer it can be if we really, uh, you know, remove the barriers uh, to expanded trade and investment <coughs> in this uh, region. So, Sanjay, you are next. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sham Saab, and uh, thank you to Raj and the Asia Society for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be in the August company of my fellow panelists. So, um, so my remarks will be quite complementary to what Sohasini said. Um, the topic, of course, w is very broad. Uh, does South Asia have a future? And uh, one can interpret it in so many uh, different ways. And I will take a, mostly a practical approach to this and uh, focus on possible different futures that might evolve under different scenarios or assumptions. Uh, and when we talk of South Asia, just as Swahasini has done, I will talk of all of the eight countries that constitute officially under SARC, constitute uh, South Asia. So I'm going to make five broad points uh, to, uh, as my thesis for this evening. So one is, uh, the first point is that the future of this integrated or the South Asia together is brighter if it is cooperative. And I think uh, both, the, both Sham Saab and Swahasini have talked about that. Uh, if there is an all of South Asia approach, right, uh, there is so much energy to be unleashed, and energy can be in quotes. And let me just point to a few specific foregone benefits of this all of South Asia approach, which is not obtaining today. Uh, one is the uh, uh, so-called CASA trade, a Central Asia, South Asia approach to energy trade, uh, uh, which can link uh, the tremendous hydro resources of Central Asia to South Asia via Afghanistan and Pakistan. A beginning has been made in this CASA 1000 uh, energy project, which is supported by the, by the World Bank. But this it does not obtain because of the current situation uh, in South Asia. The second, the, the aspect within the, the other benefits are east-west connectivity. Today we don't talk of east-west connectivity and the res things like the resurrection of something resembling the Grand Trunk Road. Uh, where we could have connectivity, connectivity from, say, Kabul to Dhaka. 
right? And all the prosperity of the people along those corridors that, that, it, that would entail. Trade uh, is merely a third. We talked about it in our report in 2018, the glass half full, when I was still in the World Bank. Uh, trade is a, a third of its potential, and I dare say that gap has increased today because economies of South Asia have been growing. And this is an es es underestimate because this one-third estimate does not include services, which have, in fact, probably even greater potential uh, than, than goods trade. Uh, half of, and why we're talking about an all-of-South Asia approach and what is the big bugbear is obviously the India-Pakistan issue. Half of South Asia trade under an open scenario could be India-Pakistan trade. Right? Today, it is nothing. It's almost zero. It is negligible. A few, uh, you know, few uh, million dollars are exported to Pakistan every month of, uh, you know, um, medicine and, and some products uh, because, you know, there is a trade, virtual trade ban on both sides since 2019. Uh, tourism skies the limit. You know, we, we know, you know in Bangladesh is the largest source of tourists to India today, both general tourism and medical tourism. I would multiply that if it, if it came on a free and open tourism between India and Pakistan, that number would, would be multiplied. The global quest for supply chain diversification today, that's happening. It happened even before COVID, happened even before the US-China trade war. But yet again, South Asia is presented with an opportunity to get its act together and become a part of global supply chains, which has never managed to do. Well, here's another opportunity today in a geopolitical sense. So this is the logic of a whole of South Asia approach, uh, where the India-Pakistan equation uh, has much to contribute, and in the absence of that, casts a huge shadow on that potential. So my second broad point, uh, sir, is that what if the current situation, current dispensation, as Swasini said, for the last seven years or so, continues to prevail in South Asia, and with Pakistan and Afghanistan largely divorced from the rest of the region. Right? Uh, well, this region will, will be certainly be less prosperous uh, because the above benefits that I just outlined will not materialize, but there are some additional issues uh, that I want to flag. And there is one is that military expenditure will be elevated for both India and Pakistan, and especially for Pakistan, and with the attendant social costs that such military expenditure entails. I, uh, I don't have to uh, go into detail on it. God knows that both India and Pakistan could do with less military expenditure. Right. Uh, the critical uh, uh, a cooperation on natural resource management and disaster risk management, again, India and Pakistan could do a lot more of that. You know, the floods, the heat waves, and all of that. There could be a lot more constructive cooperation that could go on. Uh, on trade, since the ban in 2019, uh, thousands of people have been affected in Amritsar, in the line of control areas of the Kashmir's, uh, uh, waiting for uh, this uh, small, tiny pittance, $2 billion trade to resume to 2019, let alone the $37 billion that our report talked about and would be bigger uh, today. So overall, my second point is that if South Asia operates as less than the whole of South Asia, it will be well short of potential and, and affect the welfare of the people of the entire region of every single country in the region. And currently, East and West are going separate ways. And as Sham Saab said, so my third point, so many propound this vision today, uh, the pesky neighbor vision today, that, uh, that one can forget about the West, right? Uh, focus on the East, because in any case, the East is dynamic, right? It's an Asian century, and that's what East Asia, Act East, all of that. That's the dynamic part of the world, so let's, let's go there. But it is not either or. Make no mistake about it. It is not an either or. South Asia has its own synergies, which others cannot replace, right? Uh, there, is, there is a logic, as, and uh, Suhasini uh, expounded on that. And South Asia currently functioning in a centrifugal way rather than in a centripetal way uh, uh, will be very sub suboptimal for every single country's development in the region. And why do I say development and how do I connect it to integration, connectivity, trade? Because we are so far below the norm, right? Uh, every prosperous region in the world, think of East Asia, think of North America, think of Europe, 
the distinctive feature is they connect with each other. Trade, the biggest trading partners are their neighbors, right? Uh, so US biggest trading partners are Mexico and Canada, right? And we just fail that we sort of pervert economic gravity logic on its head in, in, in South Asia. So my fourth point, sir, is that, so the next question is, assuming we buy into this thesis, is this, can we do anything to change the status quo, right? So I'm getting a little bit into the how part as well, because people will say, well, it's all very well to say this, but you know, is there ever any chance of this changing? Well, I think here, uh, it may not be so popular here, to, but India has to take the lead. India is the dominant player in the region, 85% of, of GDP, and uh, Sham Saab has already said all these other things. So, uh, uh, you know, there is no option. It has to be the generous partner and take the lead. And trade is the most obvious answer, right? Uh, currently, you know, you saw today, I saw in the mo morning papers that Maharashtra onion prices are, uh, one farmer had distress sales, right? They're at all time, they're significant lows. He made a rupee profit on selling 515 kilos of onion. Uh, the prices across the border, I checked uh, on the websites in Pakistan, there are three, at least three times higher in Pakistan. And so wheat flour, a, a very staple for the people, that is again a problem area. Wheat flour is very, very expensive. Uh, so there are many commodities which as we've done and others have done a lot of research. There are many products that can be profitably traded between between India and Pakistan. But, but and, pa and yes, Pakistan is free to import. You, you will say, why don't they import? India doesn't restrict e exports to Pakistan. But their leaders have box themselves in. We know that, right? Uh, Imran Khan will raise a hue and cry if there is any talk of uh, importing anything from India. So is there any, in, can India do anything by way of face saving here, is my question. India too has bo boxed itself in into a reciprocity kind of situation. I will not do something till you do something. So can, can it be more generous as the larger country? Can it offer any unilateral concessions like even a token donation of wheat flour or, you know, after backroom discussions. Some things continue. Kartarpur tourism continues. Medical emergency tourism continues, often with very generous uh, offers by hospitals in India. You know, free expensive operations done for, you know, emergency uh, for people who come to India. So, uh, so that continues. So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an inveterate optimist, so I always hope that something will happen. And finally, my fifth and last point, sir, is that uh, to end on a perhaps on a little bit more philosophical note, uh, is that no no situation is permanent, right? And uh, uh, I'm hopeful about change in the status quo. And you know, we had the Vajpais and the Gujarals and the Manmohan Singhs and the Nehru's, right? Who who could have made a difference? Uh, and so I'm and even uh, the statesmen of the past, even. The Modi surprise visit to Lahore, uh, uh, inviting heads to his inauguration, and so you know, I'm I'm never uh, I, I never give up. And if you work in the South Asia space, you have to be an optimist; otherwise, uh, you will not be able to work in that space. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. Thank you for ending on a much more upbeat uh, note. Uh, yes, uh, I think I think one should not give up on Pakistan, but. Uh, uh, unfortunately, our experience uh, has been that uh, uh, Pakistan has the unfailing ability to shoot itself in the foot, um, even when uh, there is there is a, there is a great deal of uh, of uh, you know logic in a sense of uh, a bilateral uh, cooperation between the two countries. I also wanted to just mention uh, before I turn to Atul that uh, one of the reasons why I feel. Uh, that uh, this kind of regional cooperation actually is is something which is very urgent is uh, putting on my climate change hat uh, because uh, when we are talking about integration amongst the South Asian uh, countries, don't forget uh, that uh, this is the Indian subcontinent is also a single ecological unit and. Uh, if we are facing, you know, challenges in terms of, you know, melting of the glaciers, um, river systems, you see what happened in Pakistan recently with the floods uh, in uh, Indus, could happen tomorrow to us. Uh, we should not uh, discount uh, that uh, possibility. 
Uh, and there is the only way that you can deal with these kind of challenges uh, is actually through collaboration. Uh, India alone, despite being the largest country, India alone cannot deal with the consequences of, for example, the melting of the glaciers. Uh, India alone cannot deal with the consequences of our river systems, uh, you know, uh, being being impacted by ecological damage or uh, by by uh, you know the the, the kind of uh, kind of um, degradation that we see uh, taking place. Um, we share a very long coastline. I mean, Bangladesh, for example, or Pakistan. Uh, and there are huge changes which are taking place in the ocean space uh, around us. Overfishing is taking place. Uh, there is a effluence, you know, a very toxic effluence from the from cultivation upstream is now coming into the oceans and creating what are known as dead zones. So if we are looking at that future, <clears throat> how do we ensure that you know uh, we remain an ecologically safe space? There is really no uh, no uh, alternative to uh, collaboration. Uh, river systems, for example, uh, river systems I always say are not pieces of property that you can cut into pieces uh, and say this is mine and that you know uh, I will take some of yours. Uh, rivers are living systems, uh, and living systems cannot be chopped up in the manner that we actually do. So if we are really looking at that much larger challenge, which really stares at us for the future, uh, then South Asia has to have a future. <laughs> because I don't think we can, we can address these kind of challenges if we do not have a future as a region. Uh, Atul, who is uh, Associate Professor of International Relations and Governance Studies at Shibnadar uh, University, and who has uh, also done a great deal of work on the region, uh, Adur, you have the floor. I'm here oh, sorry. on this side. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, and uh, I want to thank the Asia Society Policy Institute for uh, the opportunity, and I'm very glad that I'm in such uh, august company. Um, I thought that I was going to be a deviant uh, because of what I was planning to do, but uh, Ambassador Saran actually made it easy when he asked that question, which is, does South Asia have a past? Um, and that's the question that I want to uh, raise here and share with all of you, and I'm very glad that there's so many students here, uh, uh, share with you a slice of uh, the work that I'm currently doing on a book that I tentatively call uh, The United States of South Asia. Um, when you think about a region in any part of the world, what are the key elements that you need in order to put a region together? You need uh, a constellation of um, elements. You need historical circumstances. You need the right international environment. You need political um, leadership. You need a compelling reason. And you need institutional design, right? And resources and so on and so forth. What you also need in addition to all of this is an idea. And, and, and if you have a tradition of thinking about um, about either a, you know any form of political community, be it a nation, be it a region, it always helps. And the work that I'm doing currently uh, pertains to this period between the 1900s and the 1950s, early 1950s, when a whole bunch of people who are looking at uh, uh, South Asia, uh, which is also India at that moment, uh, which are lo who are looking at South Asia as uh, uh, its political future, one where Indians have uh, political agency, therefore they have the power to decide the direction in which they want to take themselves. Um, one important aspect of, of that story as I've been working away at it, uh, what I realized was that very early on, in fact as early as in the 1910s, you have the first regional visions of South Asia getting articulated. And there are two names that come to us for this entity. Uh, one is the United States of India, this is from Bipin Chandrapal, and you have the United States of South Asia from the Aga Khan in the 1910s. Um, and you also have another name, again by Aga Khan, called South Asiatic Federation, 1910s. And uh, then people play upon it in all kinds of ways, including, for example, in 1942, uh, uh, K. Munshi Sahib writes a very interesting book, he calls it Akhand Hindustan. So when you think about that, that idea itself, there is, a, there is the Akhandata, which is coming from one tradition of 
of culture and political thinking, and you've got Hindustan, which is coming from one culture or one tradition of culture and political thinking. So sort of that kind of a conversation is going on. Now, in the 1940s, something very interesting happens. Uh, people who are thinking about the region in, in, in federal, confederal terms in the 1940s are basically faced with the following question. Independence is coming. What is the shape of this independence going to be? Are we going to become independent but divided into multiple nation states? Or are we going to become independent but stay uni united? But if we are to be independent and united as a, as a geopolitical entity, as a political entity, as a, well, you know, a, a, a civilizational area, then what is the political form that we should choose for ourselves? And it's very interesting. Uh, there's a scholar named Reginald Copeland who, I think in 42 or 43, uh, you know, didn't have enough time to uh, look over my notes, but who actually gives us, gives us a very uh, well-fleshed out idea of a South Asian region. And he calls it a confederation. And at the heart of it, sir, very interestingly, is the idea that the All India Center must primarily be invested in taking care of the mega river, river basins that we have. So one for the Indus uh, area, one for uh, Ganges, one for Brahmaputra, and one for uh, peninsular uh, subcontinent. So you have that kind of an imagination coming in. Uh, as we go to the second half of the 1940s, we have uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, a book that people don't pay a lot of attention to. It's called India Divided. And he says very interestingly, I mean, this is a man who two years later will then go on to you know, head the Constituent Assembly. He says that in order to avoid partition, in order to make sure that we have some kind of a subcontinental unity going uh, once the British leave, what we need to decide is, whether, is we should do one of the two things. We should create either an unnational state in India or a multinational state in India. And, and the skepticism towards the idea that the nation state form will not work if you, want, if you want both freedom and independence, is right there, right? Uh, so what, you, what we're beginning to see now is a, you know, coming together a few elements. Federation or confederation is one way to think about the region, which means pooling of sovereignty, parcelization of sovereignty, arranging sovereign powers at different levels of government. Second, the idea that there is a sense that the nation state form is not going to work, and if it'll, if it'll work, uh, it'll end up the, you know, if it has to be implemented, you will have not just one uh, political entity in South Asia, but multiple. And there are warning signs that are given by uh, multiple people, including by um, Dr. Prasad, that if we go in that direction, we're going to be insecure, we're going to be poor, and we're going to be perpetually bickering ourselves because the problems of the 1940, uh, the decade of the 1940, the problem of, well, crudely speaking, Hindu-Muslim relations, those problems are not going to be resolved. But the last bit that I wanted to point out, point out was, uh, was, a little, uh, was a little something, an intervention that was made by Professor Radhakumud Mukherjee, um, those of you who are, uh, who are fans of Indian history. Um, in 1914, Professor Mukherjee uh, wrote a short pamphlet, he called it The Fundamental Unity of India. And it's a fascinating piece of text because it uh, traces historically the emergence of an all India geographical consciousness um, amongst the Hindus, right? Uh, in 1954, under the aegis of the Bharti Vidya Bhavan, now Bharti Vidya Bhavan was established by K.M. Munshi Sahib. So, under the aegis of the Bharti Vidya Bhavan, uh, a new issue of the fundamental unity of India was established. Was was uh, a new publication? A new issue was published. I'm sorry. And to and in that issue, there's a short foreword that uh, Professor Mukherjee offers uh, to the book. And what he says there, uh, to me, sounds like an early, very well-fleshed out example of post-national thinking. Now, you need post-national thinking if you're thinking about uh, a regionalism of nation states. What does he say in the thing? He said, all right, partition has happened. Uh, let Pakistan be an accepted reality. Let's not uh, go about you know, talking in terms of undoing partition and so on and so forth. But let's move forward. And how do we move forward? He says, take cognizance of basically three realities that we have to work with. One, as Suhanis Suhasini pointed out, the, 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 un, the um, how do I put it, the fact that geography marks the subcontinent uh, distinctly and separately from the rest of the, rest of the world. So there is, in, 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 in a lot of ways, there's a geographical coherence to the region, and that's the first thing that we need to take cognizance of. The second thing he says, and it then builds upon it, says that underlying 
this geographical distinctiveness is what he calls the geological unity of the region. And he has a very interesting term he calls, uh, we, there may be a political division uh, that, that may have come about here, but this political division, beneath this political division, you have um, rocks of the ages uh, that, that straddle uh, underneath. And these rocks of the ages have the minerals that are necessary for modern industrial develop, uh, you know, development of um, industry and, and modernization of nations. Now, why is that important? It's important because, please remember, around the same time, you're beginning to have stirrings of um, coal and steel being put together to lay the foundations of the European Union. And here you have Radha Kumar Mukherjee saying that you need coal, steel, oil, and a couple of other minerals to set these nations on the path to development. And therefore, he says, to the extent possible, let's have a common economic system, to the extent possible. So that's one. Second, he says that, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, for the Muslims who've gone to Pakistan, India, in terms of the sacred geography, in terms of the sacred sites that it offers, in terms of the monuments of political power of Muslims of the subcontinent, India remains very vital. And same is the case for Hindus, because for Hindus, Pakistan is a sacred geography. He mentions Sindh, he mentions the Rig Veda and the ways in which uh, the rivers of uh, Punjab are, are, are turned sacred and, and, and central to the Rig Vedic consciousness. And he talks, of course, about the Indus Valley civilization. He says that for cultural, historical, religious reasons as, reasons as well, you want to make sure that uh, the integration that had come about that is not undone. And then he sort of wraps up, he says, and he, and he wraps up by making, um, you know, uh, counseling that the two states do the following. He says, it is essential that the states respect, preserve, and promote these deeper unities in the life of their people without emph emphasizing their differences, which are comparatively superficial and confined only to politics, for politics does not exhaust the totality of life's interest. He says something else. He says that it's important that the countries do everything to overcome the evils of separation in the interest of general wel welfare and avoid creating, quote, new fields of division in a narrow spirit of nationalism. So you already begin to see two elements. One, that nationalism itself is fundamentally a narrow idea. And secondly, politics does not exhaust the entirety of, uh, of, of our interests and our concerns. And I found, and, and the reason I wanted to conclude on this is because uh, Suhasini's piece uh, in the Hindu uh, last month, towards the end, it actually makes precisely this point. Uh, the point is that you need to, if you can somehow delink uh, political summit level uh, equations from regional processes, then you can possibly have uh, breakthroughs in quote, quote unquote non political areas. So, this sense that somehow you can separate political differences and yet get cracking on, on, on some kind of a regional development, some kind of a regional cooperation, some kind of a regional um, um, arrangement is, is uh, original to us. It is um, old, and it's something that we can uh, build upon in one way or the other. So I thought I'll just share that uh, with you. Uh, the answer to the question, does South Asia have a path, is a resounding yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, yet another uh, topic that uh, the Asia Policy Institute should perhaps uh, have another seminar uh, on. Um, the only skepticism I have is that I doubt whether we can actually divorce uh, these integrative processes or you know collaborative processes from politics. I mean, politics is fundamental to any kind of uh, collaboration or cooperation that we are talking about. So to say that let's put aside politics and then get on with other things. Uh, I'm skeptical. <laughs> but anyway. uh, so we now have our uh, last but most distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Raja Mohan, who also uh, is actually the initiator of um, you know this series that we are doing on various topics, uh, the Asia <coughs> Policy uh, Institute. Uh, and uh, I, I must thank him for uh, actually uh, helping the IIC to uh, initiate these kind of, uh, you know, uh, discussions and uh, and uh, seminars, uh, because these are subjects that uh, usually fall by the wayside. So I, I, I think it is it is uh, 
something that I would like to uh, pay tribute to him and to the institute uh, for uh, really uh, bringing these bringing these issues uh, for regular regular interaction and discussion. So, Rajam, thank you, and you have the floor. Thank you, sir. It's really let me uh, reciprocate. Uh, the, we're really grateful for the cooperation from the India International Center to be able to do this regular talks on Asia, South Asia related issues. Uh, so I think it's really been a pooling of our resources uh, to really to, to make this uh, make this happen. And thank you all uh, for, for joining us today. And part of the reason why we framed it in this provocative sense, we've already seen the results of it. I mean, we had excellent uh, presentations by the, by the panel already and by the chair, uh, Ambassador Sham Saran. So let me take the, you know, that you create attention to actually see through the structural problems. That uh, most of us agree that the region needs to be integrated. But I think to understand the structural problem, why we can't do it. Uh, so, so let me pose this in a very in a subversive uh, and uh, probably you know, in a, a provocative manner uh, by saying that, uh, that asking the, uh, giving an answer to the main question we posed, uh, that is, does South Asia have a future? My answer is, no, not in the near term. Uh, so let me explain that, by, why I say uh, there is no, uh, the future is dim, at least uh, for the near, near term uh, in, the, in the region. One, I think that doesn't mean when we say South Asia has no future, does not take away from the objective reality of India's relationship with her neighbors. So that exists, whether you call this South Asia or call it something else, that there is a reality of uh, a phenomenon of India's relationship with its neighbor. I mean, that's a geographic reality. But what my argument is that the construction of South Asia as a framework to deal with these problems is not going to work. So let me let me uh, explain this uh, uh, in you know five broad points. Uh, but before that, I say that uh, Suhasini mentioned it. Many of you mentioned it. The term uh, before South Asia became popular was really the subcontinent. Uh, we didn't even use the word India. When we said the subcontinent, it largely meant uh, India. And it's also clear that uh, most of our panelists have said uh, when we talk about South Asia, it's really the, what we talk about the pre partition subcontinent, that it was a united region largely under the imperial thing, that there was this undivided India, uh, which was a fairly significant geopolitical entity uh, in the middle of the uh, Indian Ocean. And, and I think that had a reality. So, why we have South Asia and why South Asia doesn't work is because of the partition of this region the legacies that endure, and the difficulty as a collective for us to overcome the bitter legacies of partition. I think partly we're beginning to overcome some of them, but we're not uh, overcoming uh, all of them. Uh, and, and that's the reason why I wanted to frame this in, in these stark terms and then look at how do we transcend these, uh, this, this fundamental limitation. I think first, the concept of South Asia itself, I think, came in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, as a really at a time when the when the subcontinent was on decline, this again, most people might not agree with me, the relative decline, economic decline of the subcontinent, because the kind of economic choices that were made largely reduced its weight in the international system uh, compared to the pre-partition uh, period. And I think uh, it, it came at a period of time when actually, if you compare it to the pre-colonial period, where the subcontinent or the undivided India was far more deeply connected both to itself uh, and to the rest of the world, uh, and it was deeply in, in, you know, embedded in uh, larger trading and the globalization systems. But today, I think what we're seeing is really a restoration, I think, of post-1990 reforms that are beginning to restore <coughs> India uh, and the subcontinent as a whole. You just take the diaspora. If you combine the diasporas of the, of the eight countries, it's close to 40 plus million South Asians, if you want to call them, uh, in the Gulf, in the US, across the world, there is a large body of South Asians abroad. And the nature of the trade, even without regional integration, are the trade with the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, with the Gulf, with various Aberdeen regions of South Asia, has dramatically grown. Uh, so in, in many ways, I think the, the restoration of the footprint largely driven by India's growth uh, is bringing us back to a new era that, that we need to come to terms with it. And this could work much better, of course, if India and its neighbors had a deeper uh, economic and, and integration and, and the resolution of political problems. But I think the, the, the fact is, why we're not able to do it is because of the uh, fundamental divisions uh, that, that remain uh, within the subcontinent. 
But here, the mention of, you know, the second point I wanted to make is the least integrated region of the world. And we say, but I think that does not take into account the fact that while we had a political partition, there's nothing that preordained a political partition must be followed by an economic partition of the markets. After all, the partition took place in Bengal and Assam, now Bengal and Punjab, two, two large regions that were deeply you know, integrated with themselves. And the economic choices that we made in terms of the, the inward orientation of the economics, and which uh, everyone adopted the same socialist paths uh, by, by the 70s, everyone was a socialist. And that, I think, led to downplaying the importance of trade, downplaying the importance of regional integration, downplaying the importance of you know, open borders. Uh, actually, we allowed the pre-existing links that existed between India and its neighbors actually go to rust. And post-65, you know what happened between uh, the two Punj Punjabs and the uh, Bengal side, where the existing connectivities were fully disrupted. So therefore, uh, that the, the regional integration idea begins only when we embark on a path of economic reform. It's only the reform part that you open up your economy. You want to open up to the world, which also means you want to open up to your neighbors. So till the 1990s, therefore, there's no talk about even idea of regional integration. <coughs> but I remember a lot of people objecting in politics and the foreign office. What do you, how do you talk about integration? We do cooperation. We don't do integration because it's sovereign states cooperating rather than economic integration. So I think if the whole approach that India had before 1990, and everyone, all of us neighbors had the same thing, uh, prevented actually imagination of actually cooperation because the choices and the ideological approach to uh, how we thought about the region. But today, I think if you look at, we're already transcended trade. In the last 30 years of reform, our trade with Bangladesh today has dramatically grown. Uh, if you say in 2021, India's trade with Bangladesh was more than India's trade with Russia. Uh, that's changed last year, of course, when we fought a lot of oil. Uh, India's trade with Nepal, India's trade with uh, Bangladesh is growing fairly rapidly. And I think it's a, it's a big shift that is taking place. So my sense is it's not as grim as it looks, but I think parts of the region are making progress. Uh, and I think that's a welcome sign. And I think that also might give us the clues of how do we, how do we go forward. Second, the third, the most important point I wanted to make was, do you need South Asia or SARC to actually do regional integration? The answer, my answer is no. That in fact, the SARC and the framing of it as a regional enterprise actually has limited the possibilities of actually making advances. Here, I think uh, the SARC doesn't work. Uh, those of you are familiar, 2014 SARC summit, uh, we had uh, some minor, not fantastic uh, agreements, one road connectivity, one rail connectivity. It was cleared by officials. It was cleared by the ministers. When the principals came in to meet, the plug was pulled in Pakistan. So the Pakistanis would not willing, and even up to the ministerial level, acceptance. So my point here is, you can complain about it, you can bemoan it, but that's a sovereign choice that Pakistan is making, that it does not want connectivity with India. You might not like it. It's not something you can, you can force them to change. So therefore, I think if you accept that, the problem with Pakistan is a bilateral one. It's not rooted in South Asia or South. That it is their preferences at this point that limit the possibilities of a regional cooperation. And therefore, if you accept that, I think the, uh, uh, it's really since 2014, uh, summit of Kathmandu, then we began to see sub-regional cooperation, a range of other initiatives, uh, some of which are making a reasonable progress. Uh, certainly in the East, we've seen a significant expansion of, of attempts to construct uh, regional, uh, sub-regional cooperation uh, in, the, in the Eastern subcontinent. That again, uh, I think, uh, gives us a chance to think about a multi-speed South Asia, if you will. Uh, those who want to move should be able to move forward, rather than saying, till SARC does something, I'm not going to do anything. So where we can do it bilaterally, where we can do it plurilaterally, where we can do it multilaterally, uh, we can keep doing the expansion of trade and, and regional, uh, regional cooperation. The fourth, I fully agree with my panelists here, that, that it is India's responsibility as the largest economy, as the largest geography, uh, to take the leadership of producing that economic interest. Uh, it's not going to uh, come from others. And, and my sense is uh, that while we do the talk today, we talk a lot about regional integration. Uh, but I think uh, we 
taken a number of steps in recent years, but I think the, the road forward is, is, is quite long. Therefore, I think the burden of actually integrating the region rests with India and what we do and how we do it uh, to, to promote uh, regional economic integration. And that brings me to the, the last point, which is really what should be the instrument for bringing the region together. I'm a great champion of unilateralism. Uh, if you like, I mean, you might call it positive unilateralism. Uh, there is a lot that India can do without having to negotiate everything in a framework of aid. Uh, because uh, the lar large number of problems that we have is, is really the India's policies that limit the natural uh, hope, uh, possibilities for actually uh, regional economic integration. Uh, Ambassador Shamsan has worked on the recent efforts at power connectivity, getting the grids connected. Just to give you one example, to let Nepal sell power to Bangladesh through the narrow corridor that we have in between, years it has taken for us to say yes. I mean, is it such a big deal that we can't let Nepal sell the power it is producing to Bangladesh? And we've taken into rounds and rounds of calisthenics to actually get to say yes. We said yes, I believe, recently. So it tells you that, look, there are a lot of things that we need to change. And so bemoaning the region and lack of regional integration, what is it that India can do to promote regional integration? And I think we need to devote the scholars of policy think tanks. We must focus which are the Indian laws that actually obstruct regional cooperation? Which are the current Indian policies? We talk about ease of business. What is obstructing ease of trade in the subcontinent? For example, if you upgrade your trade facilitation, if you improve your border infrastructure, again, as Shamsan tried to do a number of things. I mean, uh, first time I visited Nepal when he was ambassador there, uh, he sent me to the border regions to cover the kind of pathetic state where our infrastructure was. I think we've done a lot of improvement, but I think here, by changing the way we work, by improving our borders as zones actually of collaboration, we go to Benapur, Petropur, you see my long queue still. So it's not a problem of South Asia. That is a problem of Indian policy, that we can't get, make it easier for people to trade, or people to move, or the ability to do digitalization of much of the transactions, which the rest of the world has done. So these are the things we don't need to negotiate with us. I mean, you can't solve the climate change problem. You can't solve river, river water management. But a lot of other things can be done unilaterally. And if we can show progress in the eastern subcontinent, that automatically will have an impact on the rest of the region. And I think we can make progress. So therefore, uh, my sense is it is India's actions, uh, India's unilateral approach, positively, I mean, not in a negative way, uh, that, that actually can produce fundamental change in the way the region operates. Because India is the only country which has borders with all the other countries. It has the economic weight. And if it changes uh, the way its boundaries operate, uh, the way its economic, you know, its economic policies operate, uh, then I think it will have a huge effect uh, on the region. And I think our, much of our research, I think we need to focus on what we need to do that can produce the change. And I think it's within our power uh, to, to, to produce it. So I would conclude by saying that what we need is to focus on the outcomes. If uh, all of us agree, we need more integration. It is the pathways that will take us there, uh, which is really about whether it is unilateral, multilateral, you know, sub-regional. But I think the important thing is to focus on outcomes, to get moving where we can, so that the region incrementally gets transformed. And my sense is, as India grows, uh, it becomes a large economy, the possibilities for doing it today, I think, unlike in the pre-90 period, we have actually the tools, the weight to actually force the region to integrate unilaterally. Stop it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we should change the change the um, title to say, uh, does India's neighborhood have a future? So. The label is, <laughs> is not important. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Raja, for uh, for uh, giving us uh, that uh, perspective uh, on um, on South Asia economic integration. Um, I would only uh, say that um, you know, um, uh, not that we do not uh, recognize the fact that uh, Pakistan does not seem to have any interest so far in uh, economic integration uh, in South Asia or uh, connectivity with uh, uh, India. Uh, there have been phases where uh, Pakistan has had a, a different uh, viewpoint and certainly 
uh, during the time that I was uh, Foreign Secretary from 2004 to 2006. Um, a great deal actually happened in terms of uh, connectivity and some of those connections uh, have actually even survived um, this deep freeze in the uh, relationship. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, we should uh, not give up entirely, uh, keep it, keep it uh, I, I think as a live uh, uh, issue and maybe a, a time will come when, when uh, uh, Pakistan also will see its own interest in terms of that kind of uh, integration. Uh, particularly, I, I think that, you know, with this, uh, uh, the Belt and Road, um, what Pakistan had described as a game changer has changed the game in a somewhat different way than they had anticipated. Uh, so I, I think there may be some, some rethink uh, on, on that uh, as well. I think we have had a, a, a tremendous, you know, set of uh, presentations. A uh, lot of food for thought, and so um, maybe in the next uh, several minutes, if there are any questions that you would like to raise, uh, please identify yourself, which institution you are from, and if there is any particular panelist to whom you are um, addressing the uh, question, uh, please also make that clear. And the question answer session will be conducted by uh, Raja because unfortunately I have to ask him. Thank you so much. Staring at uh, this point. So we will uh, maybe take three questions at a time and then we will go from there. Yeah. Use the microphone. Uh, thank you, sir. I think I'll uh, continue with your short term pessimism, if I will. I'm Bashir from CSDR. Uh, sir, my question is simple. How do you induce the creation of any political will in New Delhi to engage Pakistan? Or rather, more pro provocatively, why should India change its current policy with Pakistan? Since 2019, it's been a state of minimal ties uh, with a strictly transactional relationship, and we've proven that we can go on without Pakistan and engage each of these states bilaterally. Because our, I'd say that our own geopolitical agency has increased just as Pakistan has decreased. And you and Ms. Heather will know that my question is not laden with any adverse opinion whatsoever, but one with genuine curiosity and hope because I want to know why and how. question for Abra. a very simple question. Uh, in your conceptualization of South Asia and the, the past, um, where are the women? Because that is also a period where the transnational women's movement, not just across Europe and US, but within South Asia, as we, that, that term that we are using is very active. And I just presented something similarly for my research earlier in the day. Um, so where do you see the women? And also, how are you seeing, because when you center people, so what what conceptualization? Yeah, like and just to, yeah, yeah, and just to add on to that, I was wondering um, what role would you think the the South Asian civil society will have in the future of Asia, uh, and that speaks to the concept of democracy and ideas of democracy, which are also surfacing in the same period that you're looking at. Namaste, sir. I'm Prashant Kumar Jamia Mili Islamia, a student of undergraduate second year. हमारा क्वेश्चन ये है कि सर जब हम सोच रहे हैं साउथ एशिया के फ्यूचर क्या होगी तो हमारा क्वेश्चन ये है कि सर डेमोक्रेसी का साउथ एशिया में क्या फ्यूचर होगा क्योंकि करंट सिचुएशन में पाकिस्तान श्रीलंका डेमोक्रेसी हर एक जगह हर एक जगह पे एक करंट क्राइसिस में तो क्या फ्यूचर होगा साउथ एशिया में डेमोक्रेसी का um, disagree with everyone uh, in that I disagree that this is a conversation about India's neighborhood. This is about South Asia. South Asia is a new concept. Um, with all due respect, it is not a concept of Akhand Hindustan. It is not a concept of the geography of the past. It is about modern nation states. Eight of them, not all of them are in the same uh, league, perhaps, 
but these are the eight nation states that make up our geographic reality. So uh, over there, I just do want to disagree. I also want to say that we cannot allow ourselves to, to limit our, our scope of ambitions by the present or the past. There has to be a point, in, uh, and to your question, Bashir, there has to be a point at which you co conceptualize a future that is different from the past or the present. If we do have a problem with the fact that Pakistan does not want to do trade with India, does not want to be a part of uh, uh, the motor vehicles agreement, why don't we have a problem with the fact that Bhutan does not want to be a part of the motor vehicles agreement either? They're holding up BBIN, it's called BIN right now. Um, so uh, when it comes to motor vehicle agreement, I'm just saying that there is a future out there that is not necessarily bound only by the constrictions of the, of the present. If we keep talking about only the problems we have between India and Pakistan, all of us can write our thesis on it. Um, but we need to be able to look at what we can do outside. And I'm glad Atul brought up that point that it does not have to mean Tark. It does not have to mean the leaders getting together. It does not have to mean if you were only able as a South Asian <coughs> sort of consciousness to put aside some of the problems like visas, like allowing education, like allowing health uh, movement as, as Sanjay has spoken, you would already be changing the paradigm without necessarily doing anything, without losing anything. If you were only able to change the current um, hegemony of politics, uh, over everything else. And I think, Kushi, that answers your question. I should also say, if there were more women who were being seen in this, we probably would have a much more harmonious uh, South Asia. Your uh, question is, what is the future of democracy? I can just say one thing, that whatever the future will be, it will be because we are watching each other. And when I've seen this for so many years, when I've seen it in our neighborhood, when I go to India, I'm looking at an admiration of India नजरिए से लोग हमें देखते थे अगर पाकिस्तान में बांग्लादेश में डेमोक्रेसी भी नहीं थी मिलिट्री डिक्टेटरशिप थी फिर भी वो हमारी तरफ देखते थे थोड़ी सी ईर्ष्या के साथ कि आपके यहां डेमोक्रेसी कामयाब है कुछ यू नो एक के दिन भी आएगा जहां हमारे यहां भी होगा अब रियलिटी उल्टा है हम अपने नेबर्स को थोड़ा ज्यादा ही देख रहे हैं आजकल लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि जो फ्यूचर होगा डेमोक्रेसी का एक अच्छा ही होगा थैंक यू um, Hoshi Gilti has charged on the first question. I, I am firstly I'm looking at top-down uh, uh, conceptualizations, and the ones that I am looking at the moment, I haven't come across any full-fledged, uh, fully fleshed-out uh, uh, conceptions. But I haven't stopped looking, and you know, not started writing. Um, the civil society question. Um, I wonder if there is any civil society to uh, to speak of. Uh, you know, and such civil society as um, exists insofar as uh, its ability to shape cross-border conversations in the direction of integration. It's been completely marginalized. I mean, you know, name calling over here and all kinds of things in other places. So I'm not sure if there is um, any uh, serious role that uh, it has anymore. Your democracy question, I think there are two things लाइन्स पे अगर हम सोचें तो ठीक रहेगा एक तो ये कि 1900-2000 के दशक की शुरुआत में जो पॉलिटिकल मॉडर्नाइजेशन का गेन हमने नेपाल में देखा था अफगानिस्तान में देखा था कुछ उस श्रीलंका में भी देखना शुरू किया था पर वो वहाँ पे रिवर्सल अफगानिस्तान में पूरी हो चुकी है हमारे यहाँ पे इस वक democracy का readjustment हो रहा है जिसमें liberalism को लेकर के बहुत सारी दिक्कतें लोगों को हो गई हैं तो democracy तो हम हैं बहुत ही robust democracy हैं पर liberal democracy हैं या नहीं हैं इसको लेकर के problem शुरू हो गई है तो constitutional intent के level पर तो है पर नहीं Pakistan में very interestingly democratic energy hitting the streets is 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 just absolutely fascinating but why is that not translating into the institutionalization of democracy within the political system of Pakistan that's another uh, it, that's also something to think about so yeah, yeah so I will just take that question of Bashir's uh, on so wh what will induce interest in Delhi to have a conversation I think two, two things one is that there is seems to be a big issue of who takes the first step that there seems to be a problem on both sides so so some backroom conversations uh, obviously need to happen but I think it is, again, as uh, Ambassador Saran said, it is 
has to be India's recognition that its role as whatever it sees itself to be as ambition as a great power uh, will not be realized unless it carries its neighborhood with it. And even in an instrumental sense, right, it's, you look at, the, there is a, I mean, there is a whole world out of there, out there, which used to be the cent Central Asia, which used to have tremendous links. Now that road goes through Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we are holding back, you know, so we, there is a vision that is right now so much focused on Act East and all of that. But there is an, uh, another, another universe, and it is certainly holding back uh, overall realization of, of India. And India is, I mean, you know, there are lots of problems, and we, we can have a separate discussion on the economic issues, but certainly needs all the boost that it can get on the economic front, on the export front, on the trade front. Good evening. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so my question is, can any discussion uh, of a South Asian future be possible without taking into account the involvement of China in the region? And um, uh, and if it's not, then how do we interact and meet this, if I may use the term, challenge? Uh, hello. Uh, this is Pratyajay from Jamia Mila Islamia. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. My name is Rishabh. I'm from Political Science Department, Delhi, Delhi University. My question is, uh, we are talking about India taking the lead, and um, uh, Ms. Heather pointed out that we have a lot of commonalities, but are they enough? So my question is, uh, along with securitization of borders, there is a large tendency in the entire region regarding securitization of subjectivity of identities, that they said. So how do we deal with that in order to you know, build a common identity of a South Asian uh, in the whole region? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mrityanjay from Jamia Mila Islamia. Uh, my question to Ambassador Sarah, sir. Okay, yeah. Actually, I'm sitting there, so. Suhasini, uh, ma'am. Actually, we all uh, we are talking about the uh, security and multiple perspectives, but we are missing out one single framework that is the renewable energy sector and the energy potential of the countries, and specifically the South Asia region. Uh, entire South Asia is resource rich in terms of the renewable energy. So, what are the potential of the renewable energy sector in terms of building comprehensive network and systemi systematization of comprehensive renewable energy framework for the entire South Asia? Because it is can be a soft power tool for entire South Asia if we uh, put aside the hard power perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, so very good question. I was amazed that we got through the entire evening without discussing China. You know, in 2014, when we had the last SARC summit, um, China had actually asked to become a member of SARC. And of course, they have observer status. Um, and it was known that there were some members of uh, the grouping that wanted China to join. But they were able to agree that no, China is not a, safe, a South Asian power. Today, the situation is completely reversed. If you look pre-COVID at the figures of trade that China has, if you look at the figures of tourists that come to a South Asian country, if you look at the uh, uh, figures for investment, and if you looked at the number of students from each of these countries going to China, and I say pre-COVID because, of course, in COVID, they've all had a very bad experience with China shutting its borders and all the rest of that. Uh, China had actually outstripped India in just these years. Um, that is, as, as, as Raja said, uh, hopefully being challenged already by many of the initiatives India is taking in its neighborhood. Uh, but it is not possible to think that we are exclusive and because the Himalayas are there, we are somehow going to be able to, you know, not deal with the China challenge. In fact, I should point out that as we speak, there is a train that has started out from Shigatse um, and is going to take, I think, four days or five days more. Uh, and reach Nepal borders. This is something that was considered, you know, like it's never going to happen. Uh, uh, a decade and a half ago when I went to Tibet and saw the beginnings of this being discussed, I remember coming back to disbelief over here that, you know, have you seen the Himalayas? Do you really think we're going to, sp uh, uh, you know, China is going to be able to span them? So things are happening and we do need to look at that. I'm not saying China is a ticking clock because eventually China does not have 
the commonalities that I spoke about in the region. Uh, and that comes to, I think, um, Rishabh's question about the securitization and how to build a common identity. The fact is you don't have to build the common identity. These are organic um, relationships. And there is no better example of it to when you go abroad. You go to any conference abroad, you go to any uh, UN whatever, uh, uh, you know, agency thing, you go to colleges, campuses in every part of the world, you'll just find South Asians have a way of getting together. In the last few years, I do think there's a certain amount of polarization, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you will always find affinities uh, in the region because that is the nature of the world. We are developed uh, in, the, in that particular way. What we are doing right now by negating it is actually illogical and unnatural. Um, and as far as Mrityanjaya's question is concerned, very good point. Renewable energy is actually uh, already underway. Pakistan is being extremely myopic by cutting itself out of the uh, renewable energy grid. Uh, which has been discussed for some years. But today we are seeing a situation where Nepal is going to export to this grid. If, it, if, if we are going to allow Nepal to export to Bangladesh, we're essentially doing it over a kind of, uh, um, you know, like a stock exchange, except it's for energy. Bhutan will put into that grid. Nepal will put into the grid. The grid will give to Bangladesh. The grid may give to Sri Lanka. And it will be renewable energy because that's what Nepal and uh, Bhutan have in the most. Um, and then you'll add more things to it. You'll add wind power, you'll add uh, other uh, ideas to it. But these are all fantastical ideas that are now becoming reality. And, and I'm so glad you bring that up because it's necessary to see that the future is going to be so different that we don't need to, um, uh, that we need to engage with that future rather than the horrible present. Okay. Um, I'm going to pass the kind of question to you. But on the other one, um, subjectivity, how do you create a South Asian subjectivity, if I got that right, right? That's, that's yeah. yeah. It's about how do you create a South Asian identity that gets us to tell South Asian perspective and Right. Um, step by step, um, first thing first, um, make sure that at least your uh, local cultural resources for coexistence are not, drop, are not taken away from you and everything should not fundamentally become about your nation as opposed to another nation. So the nationalization, denationalization of the entirety of your political imagination, I think is the first step towards building some kind of a uh, South Asian consciousness. So just the first step. I mean, the multiple step, steps of which we can talk subsequently, but that's the first step. Denationalize your, your political consciousness to a fairly significant extent, if possible, if you want to sort of think in terms of a South Asian um, uh, identity. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, on South Asia and China, so actually uh, I'll have better answers for you in a year because this is the subject of my new book that I'm working on. But uh, uh, on the energy issue, uh, I'll just add a word that, uh, you know, when I was in the World Bank, so my colleagues did this work that just without any proactive measures to reduce emissions just by exploiting the full hydro potential of the region uh, between so Nepal, Bhutan, Northeast India, all of that, the carbon dioxide emissions in the region would go down by 8% over a 15 year period without any other proactive measures because there would be substitution of fuel. And so if there is transmission, uh, more transmission lines, there is the one can exploit the seasonality and demand between you know between India and Nepal, for example. So there is tremendous scope for for that. And as I said earlier, the CASA, the Central Asia South Asia link, if that comes into play with the hydropower of Central Asia and Afghanistan and Pakistan coming, if that comes into play, then the potential is I, you get beyond I think beyond the imagination.
Do you actually, Mr. Rajamon? Um, well, you know, in '85, when it was inaugurated, talk in Bangladesh, and everybody was very excited with a lot of fanfare. And they even thought of a bank in Bhutan. And when I went to Bhutan in 2008, people said, "Bank is non-functional. There's nothing happening in the bank. There's no currency." So I was wondering that every member state must be thinking: if there is no bank, no currency, what kind of a trade? are we going to get into? None of member states are interested in visa and all. I mean, mostly visas were free. You could go to Bhutan, you could go to Sri Lanka without a visa. So people have been very practical and they are doing bilateral works and they are not trying to make SARC strong. And as far as the China wanted to get in, I think they want the yuan to be the currency in the SARC nation. That's why they want to get in. Just one more last uh, my name is Ishan Falter. I'm a first year MA student at uh, JNU. Uh, my question is how do you how do you deal with the colonial baggage that uh, South Asia as a region has? Because when we look at the inception of South Asia, uh, we see that there was exclusion of Afghanistan, which essentially goes on to show that uh, the colonial powers, the Britishers, wanted to see India as a unity, and they did, could not co uh, colonize Afghanistan. So, so they wanted to show Afgan Afghanistan as something that was chaotic. That was not that was not known. So there was a binary that would uh, that, that was created by this colonial uh, invasion, and that's how that's that's how the inception. Yeah, that's that that led to the inception of South Asia as a region, and then we have power dynamics playing neo-colonialism coming in, USA playing in, Afghanistan coming in to South Asia and going. On. So how do you deal with the colonial baggage uh, in the very inception of this region? Thank you. Just one more. What about Myanmar? Same question. One more. Hello everyone, my name is Aniksha Roy and I'm a first year MA student in JNU. My question is directed towards Suhasani ma'am. So I want to particularly ask you about the role of public opinion and are there any political incentives today in India which would perhaps propel us towards a more regional sort of dialogue towards regional integration? Uh, so on BRI, uh, what kind of future does Belt and Road Initiative have? So I think we all know that China is going through a lot of internal issues, internal turmoil, uh, you know, post-COVID, you know, during COVID and so on. So there's certainly some some rethinking. They've re re relabeled even the BRI. I mean, uh, there are at least outreach initiatives, a global development initiative and all. But make no mistake, China is uh, the world's second largest economy. It still has massive savings still has massive surplus capacity. So some of the economic, fundamental economic drivers of BRI we are not going to go away, right? So I think one should not become complacent that you know China is not going to. Now, it China, unfortunately for China, uh, a lot of the countries that it has lent to are also in debt distress, right? Which is, you know, two thirds of the poor world, right? So that is an issue that it has to deal with. It is a big issue of image. And, you know, we are seeing that playing out in Sri Lanka where it is seen as recalcitrant and holding out. Everybody else has come on board, but China hasn't. So I think China has to deal with some fundamental issues on BRI. But as far as India and South Asia are concerned, it's not going anywhere. It's going to you know, be present and be present probably even more uh, deeper than it has. Marco's question, India-Pakistan logjam, I already tried to answer the best way. I, your, you know, I think anybody can answer that, but I, I, I attempted to. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll stop with that. I think the most important legacy of colonialism insofar as South Asian regionalism is concerned is partition and not what happens. Afghanistan, of course, is one part of it, but how do you deal with partition as a legacy of colonialism is a real question. And well, you know, uh, tomes have been written about it. Uh, thank you. And I always find it funny that, or sad, uh, that when we talk about dealing with engaging with the pain of partition and, and what it has done and the colonial baggage for our region, our immediate uh, response is actually to fight within our country. Yeah. 
not to hold the people who, who carried it out responsible, not to hold the people who could have had the choice to leave India to its own devices at that time uh, responsible. Um, uh, very quickly, you said, uh, how do you deal with the idea of culture? Very good point, and I'm glad to hear that you deal with some of the frustrations we do. Look, eventually the questions are, you know, about our reality, we make it into, uh, into the only thing that can happen. Just because it's not happening right now, do we not remember that there was a past when Abida Parveen performed in Delhi or that Fawad Chaudhary or Mayra Khan were part of Bollywood? I mean, it was just a few years ago. Uh, it could be again. Do we not realize that as we speak, and in the MEA you should know this, we have just gone through an entire SCO film festival, which includes Pakistan. So somehow or the other, everyone gets worked up if you were to tell me that a Pakistani movie is showing in India. But somehow when, when we say that we're engaging with Pakistan, we're doing anti-terror exercises with Pakistan, uh, as a part of SCO, we, we put up with it. It's because the people who are creating this public opinion are actually finding it inconvenient to deal with this but they find it more convenient to deal with that. It's a political thing. And, uh, um, and finally, um, uh, so the role of public opinion when you ask, uh, I have my own sense of South Asia and public opinion is that the moment you actually open the doors for South Asians to meet each other, public opinion is positive. Uh, the moment you try to restrict it, make it about security, make it about visas, make it about terrorism and all the rest, uh, you will have a, a negative public opinion. Um, and finally, you know, we moved on from banks. We're now in internet. We're in the day of rupee. None of it will matter in the future. Thanks. I think uh, all good things must come to an end. And I think uh, I really want to thank all of you uh, for joining us this evening. But before I thank the panelists, I just wanted to uh, mention a few things that, that came up. And, uh, look, on Pakistan, it's, again, I think the initiative in the end is with us. And we've seen the government can take the initiative. When Mr. Modi went unilaterally or invited the Pakistan to meet us. Or for that matter, for all the negativity that you hear, there was an agreement that was negotiated in February 2021. A ceasefire agreement was negotiated. And if you read the three liner from the two director generals of military operation, they talk about resuming dialogue. Both the core issues will be addressed. So it's not that there is no intent. I think what's happened in Pakistan, because if you go back to February 2021, March 2021, General Bajwa talked about geoeconomics, overtaking geopolitics, the need for good neighborly policy, the idea that uh, there would be trade. In fact, after ceasefire, the idea was you start restoring the diplomatic relations, you start incrementally on trade, but then they had internal differences between General Bajwa and Imran Khan on how to actually go forward. And the argument being that look, India must make some concessions on what happened on August 2019 on the Kashmir status. So I think it got caught in their own thing. But I think <coughs> if you said, look, my the argument of unilateralism is we must keep trying. So it is not one that Pakistan is going to do as a favor. Look, if I want a different region, it's my leadership, my responsibility to constantly try for a way out and not frame it as a, as a bilateral problem. And I think given our size, our capabilities, and I think that unilateralism is my main point that we have the capacity to take initiatives, and I think we need to keep uh, taking those uh, initiatives. Second, I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, Suhasini mentioned, uh, Bhutan, why is Bhutan upset with BJP? Uh, it's an interesting history of South Asia. Smaller countries protect themselves, their sovereignty, by denying connectivity. I think uh, you mentioned Afghanistan. Actually, it was not British who didn't want to go in. They would love to take the Indian railway. Two railway lines, one went to Peshawar, one went to Quetta, including from my small town in Andhra Pradesh. The trains ran all the way to Quetta and to Peshawar. The, G the Grand Trunk Express from Chennai ran to Peshawar. That was the Grand Trunk Express. Uh, so it was the king of Afghanistan who said, look, anybody who gets into board of a train will have his legs chopped. Because for him, modernization, bringing the imperial power inside Afghanistan was a threat to his sovereignty. No, you can criticize it, but the fact is protection of sovereignty through denial of connectivity. Now, in the case of Bhutan today, if you open up that border to traffic, imagine all the South Asians marching into Bhutan. Already you see the problems of everywhere in the world. You see what's happening to our hills. Uh, the fear that the volume of you know, ingress into their territory would create problems. And I think uh, at least there is an understanding that, look, if they can't do it, they won't do it. But meanwhile, India, Bangladesh can do a lot of things. 
And as long as we keep moving in that direction, you're already making a lot of progress. Because I think what's happened between India and Bangladesh doesn't get enough notice on connectivity, river water movements, uh, transit is still a big issue at one point. And today we are doing a lot more uh, across the region. I think this side of the positive story, uh, the transformation of India Bangladesh relationship, uh, is the eventual model uh, where you have the whole region actually benefiting from a greater openness, greater trust. But I think it has to be worked at. And, and I think the problems of partition partly be beginning to overcome in the eastern subcontinent, but the western subcontinent, there are huge issues between us and Pakistan, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. I think this is going to take a longer, longer time. The third aspect, I think, on China, that China is the second largest economy. They can't be kept out. So if you, there's no Himalayas are not a war. Actually, Buddhism traveled across the Himalayas with no infrastructure. So I think they were always cross Himalayan connectivity always existed. But it's the Chinese who brought a massive amount of modern engineering into I mean, across the Karakorams, across the Tibetan Plateau, across the eastern Himalayas into Burma, and all the way the pipeline has come to Chapu in, in, in the uh, Arakan coast. So I think the Chinese party, Communist Party is called Communist Party of Engineers. So they can bring in the money, they can actually do these gigantic engineering projects. And I think that is changing the region. So the question is, how do we deal with the new pressures on, on uh, regional integration? And for us, it's a shame on us that Bangladesh, with whom we have 4,000 kilometers of border, that China has more trade with them. So there's something wrong with us. Again, that takes me back to the point of unilateralism, that we need to do more to be able to facilitate the region. And my final point uh, is, uh, Mr. Ambassador Shamsaran said, is it about South Asia or is it about India's neighborhood policy? But I'm saying that it's only an <coughs> activist, unilateral Indian policy that will produce the outcomes to bring the region together. And I think that is my main point. And I think how we get there is the, is the more important thing than the specific processes by which we get there. And I think the, the initiative will have to come from India. So I'll stop here. And I want to thank the four panelists, and Ambassador Shamsarin, who is not here, for running this wonderful conversation. And for all so many things, so many young people around this table today, thank you all for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you again the next time we do public events. Thank you. Thank you.